Welcome to day four of our daily scripture reading. Today we're going to be reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and also the book of Jubilees, chapter 3, verses 17 to 35. Now, this is going to be wonderful. This is going to be awesome, uh, especially this particular portion of scripture talking about the fall of man. Okay, let's get right into this. Genesis, chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any animal of the field which Yahuwah God had made. He said to the woman, Has God really said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Now, let's just look at this for a second. The serpent was more subtle. It doesn't say he was more violent. It doesn't say that he was more whatever, but he says he was more subtle, more subtle, more cunning than any animal of the field which Yahuwah God had made. He said to the woman, Has God really said you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Now, stop there for a second. Again, I encourage every one of you to, to uh, look at one of my previous videos called you know, Satan's Deception, Has God Said? Now, you see, God said, if you look back in Scripture, look, at, look back to our previous uh, readings, um, God said you can eat of any tree except this one, okay? So he did say you can eat of any tree. Now you see the serpent really being really subtle here said, has God said you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Okay, so let's read on here. Verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat uh, fruit from the trees of the garden, but not of, not the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat of it. You shall not touch it, lest you die. Now, again, I'm going to stop here for a second. Now, the woman here actually gave the serpent way too much room. She just kind of rambled on a little bit, and you start to see that the woman was starting to be deceived here just by the way she rambled on. What she should have said, she should have said, no, God did not say we shall not eat of, of any tree of the garden. You know, because that's not what he said. He said, you can eat from every tree except for this one. Okay. So she's starting to get deceived a little bit here. She's starting to kind of ramble on and not really answer specific, specifically directly. Remember Yeshua? Remember Jesus said, you should answer yes or no. Anybody, anything d different is of the devil. You know, a, a clear yes or a clear no. The woman really didn't give a clear yes or a clear no here. Very, uh, very important to understand this. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, You won't really die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, here again, we got a lot of stuff here mixed up together here. We've got truth, and we've got lie, okay? And this is the way I always, you know, we all know that this is the way the deception happens. It's a lie clothed in truth it looks like it looks like it's truth but there's this little lie there's this lie that is the foundation of everything that really makes it you know really deceives a person so the lie is you won't really die yes you will really die now the rest of it is true god knows that you know in that day you eat of it your eyes will be open and you will be like god knowing good and evil so you'll be like god in the sense that you'll be you'll, you'll know good and evil like god is withholding information from you so, you know, Satan is really digging in deeper here, and the woman is just falling into it. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. Okay, let's, let's really get into this. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I've never heard anybody else talk about before. Never heard anybody else preach before. Now, there's three things here, okay? The woman saw that the tree was good for food, okay? Good for food is one particular thing she saw. The other one was a delight to the eyes. It was a beautiful tree, a beautiful, beautiful tree. Another one was that it was, you know, desirable to make one wise, okay? To really puff you up, okay? Three things, good for food, delight to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. And she took of its fruit and she ate. Now, I want to skip way ahead here. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. 
verse 15, right here, the part I got highlighted. John says, don't, don't love the world or, or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the Father's love isn't in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life isn't the Father's. But it's the world's. The world is passing away with his lust, but he who does the does God's will remains forever. Here again, we got three different um, categories here. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Okay? That's exactly what we see in the Garden of Eden. We see, I'll go back here again, good for food, a delight to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. Good for food, that's the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the material thing, the, the food, you know, um, the, the Bible makes us, um, draws a connection between uh, food and even sexual immorality. You know, it says Esau was considered to be a fornicator in the book of Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, just because he chose soup, a food, over his birthright, over something spiritual. Okay, so you need to understand here. This is a very deep, very, in, very important thing to understand. A very powerful, very awesome spiritual nugget here that food and sexual sin is kind of like sisters, sister lusts. Okay, uh, some people they might not have a lust for uh, food, but they might have a lust for s sexual sin. They might not have a lust for sexual sin, but a lust for food. Uh, too much food that would be, uh, or you know, the wrong kind of food that would be. But here we go. Good for food. That is the lust of the flesh. Delight to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes. And desirable to make one wise. That's the pride of life. So here we are in the exact same order that the Apostle John brought to us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Okay, a lot of people love John 3, 16. I like 1 John 2, 16. Talks about the three, I call it the trinity of sin. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. The trinity of sin. Lust, lust, and pride. So she took it and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband with her, and, and he ate it too. Now, again, I'm going to stop here. This is awesome, awesome stuff here. Now, Yeshua, Jesus, Hamashiach, the Messiah, okay? The scriptures declare that he is the first fruits, okay? He's considered to be a fruit, okay? It also says that the cross in the scriptures is like synonymous with a tree. The tree, fruit, cross, Yeshua, okay? A tree with fruit, cross, Yeshua. I know some of you are starting to get this now. So the cross or the tree that Yeshua was basically hung on, because it says cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, as it says in the scriptures. He was crucified on that tree. He, that fruit was up on that tree. Now, just as Satan here, just as the serpent here tempted Eve to, to take the fruit off the tree, so was in the, in the crucifixion, Satan tempted Yeshua, come down off the cross, come down off the cross. See, the serpent, you see, Satan, the devil, wants the fruit to come off the tree. He does not want it to be crucified. He does not want it to be up, to be up there on the tree. He wants you to partake of the fruit, okay? He wants you to come down off that cross, okay? So that cross is symbolic of a tree, and the fruit here is symbolic of Christ. Now, sin came into the world by a fruit being taken down off the tree. By the fruit being taken off the tree, sin came into the world. God reversed that by taking that fruit, Jesus, and putting it back up on the tree, the cross, okay? Very awesome thing here. You need to understand this. Now, verse 7, the results of taking the fruit off the tree, their eyes were opened. They both knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They heard Yahuwah's voice walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife 
hid themselves from the presence of Yahuwah among the trees of the garden. Now, when there's sin in your life, you hide yourself. When there's sin in your life, you are afraid, okay? You've got godophobia. You, you hide yourself, okay? When there's sin in your life, you do not really desire the presence of God. You don't really desire to get into the scriptures. You don't really desire to be around the people of God. You just kind of hide yourself away in all different, I mean, all different kinds of ways to hide yourself. Yahuwah God called to the man and said, where are you? Called to him and said, where are you? The man said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Oh boy, oh boy. That, I tell you, Adam really gave it away, didn't he? And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? I, I told you not to take that fruit off the tree. I told you to stay on the... I told you, you know, not to come down off the cross. I told you to stay on the cross. I told you, stay there. I told you, sacrifice, sacrifice. Don't steal the sacrifice. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate it. Uh, of course, you know, the man blames the woman and Yahuwah said to the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and ate. Okay, now let's just go back here to see if Adam actually said that the woman deceived him. It doesn't say here that the woman deceived him. And this is also, we see this in the writings of Paul, where Paul brings it down saying, Adam wasn't deceived, but it was the woman that was deceived, not Adam. Okay, so Adam was, his fall was that he fell into the trap of the woman. Not that he was deceived, but that he listened to the woman over listening to God. That was his problem. That was his problem. He kind of fell into the trap of the woman. He let the woman basically take the throne and not God. Okay, and so the woman says here, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Yahuwah God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all livestock, above every animal of the field. You shall go on your belly and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. And, the woman, and to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain and childbirth. You will bear children in pain. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Okay? Now, let's just go back here. Uh, said to the woman, I will put... An I will put hostility between you and the woman. Oh, excuse me. He said that to the serpent. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. When it's talking about her offspring here, it's not just talking about all of her children, although you could say that. It's talking about specifically Yeshua. We're going to get into this right here. He will bruise your head. Yeshua will step on the serpent's head. And you will bruise his heel. The, the devil will bite his heel, will strike him in a part of his body, which is really the lowest part of his body. But he, the seed being Yeshua, will strike the serpent in the greatest, most important part of his body, his head, and, and destroy him. This is what... We read about later when, he, when we talk about the Son of Man. The Son of Man literally is the Son of Adam, Ben Adam. Now, when you say the Son of Man to any Jew, especially in these days, in, in the uh, in, you know, uh, first century, uh, they knew exactly what you were talking about. When you said Ben Adam, they knew exactly what you were talking about. Ben Adam means the Messiah. This is the first... Uh, promise we've got here of the Messiah. Okay, he will bruise your head, but you will bruise his heel. The Messiah, the son of Adam, Ben Adam, the son of man. Okay, very, very important point. Uh, some of you may have heard people say that the, the term, the phrase son of man meant a whole lot more than son of God. 
You know, a lot of people would say son of God, especially Christians today would think son of God actually carries more weight than son of man. No, you need to understand what son of man actually means, what it's referring to. It's talking about the Messiah. It's talking about Messiah. It is basically branding somebody as this is Messiah. Okay? Son of God, not necessarily in the mindset of the people back then did it have the connotation of Messiah, but the term Son of Man did. Okay, that's why uh, people were so angry when Yeshua called himself the Son of Man. It's like, what? Son of Man? You, you know, they were like really angry. You're claiming to be the Messiah, is what they were thinking, really, in, deep inside them. Okay, uh, God said to Adam, because you have listened to your wife's voice. Here it is. Not because you were deceived, but because you listened to your wife's voice and ate from the tree, about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. The ground is cursed for your sake. You will eat from it with much labor all the days of your life. It will yield thorns and thistles to you, and you will eat the herb of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your face until you return to the ground for for uh, for you were taken out out of it for you are dust and you shall return to dust the man called his wife eve because she would be the mother of all the living yahuwah made garments of animal skins for adam and for his wife and clothed them but it says here in verse 22 yahuwah god said behold the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil now, lest he reach out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, Yahuwah God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Okay, so once again, here we see that God expelled Adam. God didn't forgive Adam here. I mean, perhaps you can say all kinds of different things about oh god was very kind to adam and stuff but you know god did not say oh that's okay adam you know what you're just human you'll sin no that's not what he did he cast him out of the garden and assumedly cast him out of the garden for at least a long time if not forever okay why because of his knowledge okay and we see this later on in the scriptures too when it comes to the the, the tower of babel um the the knowledge that men uh, attained and the power that he attained god has limits to that knowledge and that power and so i believe that we are approaching those limits very soon and i think that at the same time the same way that god intervened uh, in the days of adam he intervened in the days of uh, the tower of babel for the same reason he intervened in the days of Noah for the same reason. He will intervene in our, you know, very soon for the same reason. Too much power that sinful man has. I mean, look at all the atrocities that man is doing, especially in the area of abortion, let alone all the other sexual immorality and stuff that we are trying to justify or have, you know, brought our own justification for, which really isn't justification at all. It's just hypocrisy. But... Um, yeah, when you get too much knowledge, too much power, God steps in. He says, wait a second. No, 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 no. You are not supposed to have that much knowledge, not, not supposed to have that much power. You cannot. Because if I, if I let that happen, it will be complete catastrophe for all of creation. And that's what people need to understand, that man is inherently evil. That's why we need the cross. We need the sacrifice. We need to identify with that sacrifice. Okay? So he sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. Not that he wasn't tilling the ground in the garden. Okay? Because he was tilling the ground in the garden. That was one of his jobs. And we, we read this before in the book of Jubilees. This was one of his jobs in the Garden of Eden was to till the ground. But he was cast out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground in you know the outer you know outside of the garden of eden from the same ground that he was taken so he wasn't taken from the ground of the car of the garden of eden he wasn't created from the dust of the garden of eden he was created from the dust outside of the garden of eden that is another whole huge topic right there 
He was created from that dust outside of the Garden of Eden, and now he was expelled out of the Garden of Eden back to that same position, okay? If he were created in the Garden, perhaps he would never have ever been expelled from it. He was, he was created from the ground outside, therefore he was a sinner, and... Um, and look, I mean, we see what we see the outcome of that. Verse 24. So he drove out the man and placed cherubim, okay, cherubim, powerful angelic creatures, it says here in the uh, uh, in the footnotes, messengers of gods with wings. And we will read that in the book of Ezekiel later. So uh, he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So let's go right now to the book of Jubilees and see what the book of Jubilees says. Starting right here. And after the completion of seven years, which he has, which he had completed there, seven years exactly, and in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, the serpent came. Okay, okay, no, wait, we got way more information here about days, years, uh, I mean, Again, the author of the book of Jubilees loved to keep numbers, okay? And loved to keep time and, and keep, you know, keep track of numbers here, which is very important. So, the serpent came and approached the woman. The serpent, and the, and the serpent said to the woman, Hath God commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Here we go again. <laughs> the woman sort of said, No, God, God did not say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He said, that we, he said that we could eat of every tree of the garden, except this one. But she didn't answer like that. She said to him, Of all the fruit of the trees of the garden, God has said unto us, Eat, but of the t fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said unto us, You shall not eat thereof, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Once again, here we go. We've got the woman kind of rambling on too much. She should have just gave a simple, specific answer. No. Okay? She just kind of was getting, she was getting, beginning to be drawn into this deception. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that the that on the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened, and you shall be, you will be as gods, and you will know good and evil. And the woman saw the tree, that it was agreeable and pleasant to the eye, and that its fruit was good for food, and she took thereof and ate and eat. Okay? Here again, we got, you know, talking about pleasant to the eye, good for food and stuff, but we don't have the specific things like the way the book of Genesis brings it down, okay? Although you couldn't, you may be able to exegete some of that stuff out of here, the pride of life, the, the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. Okay, and it says here, and when she had first covered her shame with fig leaves, she gave thereof to Adam, and he ate, eat, and his eyes were opened, and he saw that he was naked, okay? Here's a good point right here. She had first covered her shame. Now, this is very interesting. She first covered her sh herself before she gave to Adam. Now, don't you think that Adam should have just looked at that and said, hmm, this is something really, really strange here. Why would you cover yourself like this? Don't you think he would have thought something like that? What? You know? Well, who knows what he thought? And he took fig leaves and sewed them together and made an apron for himself, and covered his shame. Now here we got a little bit more information. Not that he made like a little, you know, a little covering for himself like that, but it says he actually made an apron for himself. And, you know, uh, in context here, perhaps it was, uh, you know, a full body apron. You know, it says right here, made an apron for himself. And this is something that we don't see in the book of Genesis. And covered his shame. And God cursed the serpent and was wroth with it forever. God was angry with the, serp with the serpent forever. So, you know, a lot of people would think, well, why wouldn't God just, you know, be angry for a little bit? Like, this was his creation, you know. The serpent was his creation. Why wouldn't God just, you know, maybe he's just angry for a little bit and then he gets over it. Maybe he forgives the serpent. Maybe, you know, all that kind of stuff. No, it says here, wroth. 
He was angry forever, forever. And it says here, and he was wroth with the woman because she hearkened to the voice of the serpent. Now here again, we've got a chain here of, uh, what would you call it? De degradation, a chain of sin. Adam listened to Eve. He shouldn't have. He shouldn't have. He should have listened to God. Okay. It, there's a backward digression here. Uh, instead of Adam listening to God, Adam listened to Eve. Instead of instead of Eve listening to Adam, Eve listened to the serpent. Okay. So we're going backwards. We're going down. So he. Uh, so God said, because she hearkened to the voice of the serpent, and did eat. And he said to her, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your pains. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your return shall be unto your husband, and he will rule over you. In other words, God, now the part of the uh, returning to the husband was not part of the curse. I mean, this is what she should have done to begin with. She should have let the, her husband rule over him, because again, this is what God's plan was in the beginning. God gave Adam the command first, then he created Eve later. God gave Adam the command first, and then he created Eve later. Why did he do it that way? Why didn't he create both Adam and Eve together? Why did he not just create a unisex race? Because this is the way God wants it. This is the way God created it. He created them male and female. He created them male and and female, okay? And he created the male first, gave the male the commandment because it was the man's job to enforce that commandment, okay? To make sure everything was uh, in line with that commandment. It was the man's job to enforce that commandment properly and effectively. And it wasn't the woman's job to do it for herself. It was the man's job to enforce that commandment to make sure that Eve followed that commandment. It was, the, it was Eve's job to listen to Adam. It was Adam's job to listen to God, okay? Uh, so again, it wasn't a curse that uh, that the woman was supposed to submit to the, to the man. Rather, it's what it was supposed to be. As it says here, you, your return. Now, a lot of times in Scripture, the word return is the same word uh, that means repent. You know, teshuva in the Hebrew, to return. To, to come back, to answer. What this passage could have been referring to was the woman's repentance, for, uh, repenting from letting the serpent rule over her to the way it should be, to letting her husband rule over her. That's the way God made it. Again, God gave Adam the command, not Eve, for a reason. God wanted Adam to enforce that commandment. God wanted Adam to bear the responsibility of that commandment, not Eve. And right here we will pick up. And to Adam also he said, because you have hearkened to the voice of your wife. And this is what we talked about here also in, the, in the Genesis. This was Adam's greatest problem. He wasn't deceived by the serpent. He listened to his wife. That's what his problem was. He listened to his wife and not to God. You know, and so, I mean, there, there are times when God wants you to listen to your wife. For example, uh, Abraham and Sarah. You know, Sarah said, you know, get rid of this bond woman and her son. And it, 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 uh, it displeased Abraham. It really vexed him and stressed him out. But God said, listen to your wife. Okay. So there are times when a man's supposed to listen to his wife. There are times when a, the man's supposed to say, no, what, the, what, what my wife says is not right. I should be listening to God. Let's continue. And has eaten of the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat thereof. Cursed be the ground for your sake. Okay. Here we go. Now, not only did Adam bear the, the consequences of his sin, but the ground itself did. The earth itself did. You know, we will read later on in the scriptures how the earth is defiled by the sin of man. Now, you know, when you think, you know, someone does something wrong, it's just them that bears that, you know, that that burden of, uh, of responsibility, that burden of being uh, punished or that curse 
uh, that would come upon that person for disobedience. But not so. It could mean it could spill out to other people. It could spill out to the land itself. It could spill out to animals and all kinds of things. Okay? Cursed be the ground for your sake. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the, your bread in the sweat of your face till you return to the earth from whence you were taken. For earth you are, and unto earth shall you return. This is the reason why Adam sinned, because he was taken from the earth. He was created. He was not born of God, okay? Now, this is something that we're going to be dealing with later, especially when we start reading the epistles of John, that there is a reason why Adam sinned, and there's a reason why Jesus did not sin. Jesus did not sin, Yeshua did not sin, because he was born of God, Adam sinned because he was created of God, okay? Everything, it's like um, uh, we're created in, 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 in God's image, okay? Everything that man creates with his hands has a beginning and has an end. That's just the way it is. Everything that you, that you create has a beginning, obviously, and has an end, okay? Nothing lasts forever that you create, Okay, that's the way it is with God too, since man is made in God's image. Okay, everything God created with his hands has an end. Everything that God created is corruptible and does corrupt and is corrupting. Okay, everything. But that which is born of God assumes the nature of God, becomes one with God, and therefore cannot be corruptible, is not corruptible, and does not sin because they're they're not subject to that corruption. Okay, now this, this is a, I know this is a deep concept and I hope you get it, but those who are born of God take on the nature, share in the nature of God because you're born of God. Because if you're born of human, you, you share in the nature of hum, of a human. Okay, you are by nature a human. If you're if uh, if you're born of a cat, you share the nature of a cat. If you're born of a dog, you share the nature of a dog. Okay, if you're born of a human, you share the nature of a human. If you're born of God, you share the nature of God. Okay, if you're born of God, you share the nature of God. That's why it says in the epistles of John that those who are born of God cannot sin. Because if you really are submitting to that God nature, if you're born of God, now that's a, another great big question right there because 99.99% of everybody who claim to be a Christian or claim to be a believer in God is not born of God, okay? There's a big difference uh, between those who are a believer, between those who just go to church, between those who say, I'm a Christian, and those who are really born of God. If you're really born of God, you do not need anyone to tell you that you are born again. You know you're born again. If you're really born of God, you know it. And other people may not know may not know the phrase born of God, but other people will see and, and, and understand, listen, this person has changed dramatically. I mean, from darkness to light, this person is like, there's a night and day difference here, okay? So when you're born of God, you share with the nature of God. But when you're created of God, you are subject to corruption because everything that's created is corruptible. And because of that corruption, you are subject to sin. This is why Adam sinned. This is why Jesus did not sin. This is why Yeshua did not sin. Adam sinned because he was taken from earth, therefore to earth he shall return. You know, that's just like one of the laws of the universe. You're taken from the earth, you will return to the state of the earth. Here we go, uh, continuing. And he made for them coats of skin and clothed them and sent them forth from the Garden of Eden. Again, very interesting. God made for Adam and Eve coats of skin and clothed them. So they wore, they were the first garments that was ever created 
was leather garments. And on that day, on which Adam went forth from the garden, he offered as a sweet savor an offering, frankincense, galbanum, and stocked, and spices in the morning with the rising of the sun from the day when he covered his shame. Again, let's not skip over this. Let is, let's go right into this a little bit deeper. He offered a sweet savor, an offering, okay? Now, how did Adam know anything about an offering? How did he even know enough to make an offering, okay? This is because the Word of God is eternal. The Word of God is eternal just as God is eternal. There is no beginning. There is no ending to the Word of God. There is no beginning. There is no ending to the Word of God in the flesh. The Word of God personified Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. So how did Adam know enough to make an offering? I mean, how did he even know anything about making an offering? Because he knew the Torah. He knew the law of God. He had to have known at least some law in order to know enough to make an offering and in no, in, to know what to offer, to know what God expected in the offering. To know any detail about an offering at all, you have to have some kind of a law. You see, Adam knew the Torah before it was written down because he walked and he talked with God. And the Torah, the law of God, is eternal because the law of God, the Torah, is the Word of God. And there's no beginning, no ending to the Word of God. As it says in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, your word, your word, O Lord, your word, O Yahuwah, your word, O God, is forever settled in heaven. Not temporary, forever, okay? So Adam knew enough to make an offering, and he knew exactly what to offer. Okay, spices in the morning with the rising of the sun from the day when he covered his shame. And on that day was closed the mouth of all beasts and of cattle and of birds and whatever walks and whatever moves so that they could no longer speak. Ah, here's, a, here's something we don't see in the book of Genesis either. That the, the animals could actually speak. Okay, now we see a glimpse of this that happened, you know, with, with Balaam, you know, when he was going to curse Israel and his donkey actually spoke in an intelligible language. So we see that glitter that came from, you know, the days of the Garden of Eden. We see that kind of flashback. But the animals did speak. It says the beasts, the cattle, the birds, whatever walks, whatever moves. Okay, they could speak. I mean, think about it. I mean, how far do you go with that? I mean, do, do you know, did the little, did the mice speak? Uh, you know, did the little uh, smaller animals speak? Did the insects speak? You know, I don't think probably insects would have spoken back then. I don't know. But it says here, whatever moves, whatever walks of birds, cattle, beasts, and, you know, etc. It says here, for they had all spoken one with another, with one lip and with one tongue. In other words, they all spoke the same language. That's all that means. One, one lip and one tongue, that's what it means. Speaking the same language. And he sent out of the Garden of Eden all flesh that was in the Garden of Eden. Again, so the sins of Adam and Eve, the sins of humanity does, is not restricted to humanity. Everything suffers, okay? The animals. Um, it says here, he sent uh, all flesh out of the Garden of Eden. The animals, the birds, whatever. I mean, the, the, the earth itself moans because of sin. I mean, you got a lot of people today. You got a lot of people today. These, these people, these liberals that, oh, save the earth, save the earth so much, you know, save the earth, you know, save the environment, yet they promote sin, it's just like biting the hand that feeds you. You cannot promote sin and save the earth at the same time. 
It doesn't matter, you know, how much carbon tax you might throw on somebody or, or all this, you know, green this, green that. I mean, the, the, the greenest thing you can do is live righteously. Obey the, the, the law of God. Obey the rules of God the way that God wanted you to obey it. Do not sin. Therefore, the land is not going to be defiled. The land is not going to, you know, suffer. The earth is not going to suffer because of humanity's sin. And all flesh was scattered according to its kinds and according to its types unto the places which had been created for them. So again, here's another interesting little tidbit here that God created places for them. And apparently it wasn't really the Garden of Eden because they wouldn't be kicked out of the Garden of Eden just to go to the place that was created for them and doesn't make any sense. So they were in the Garden of Eden for uh, you know a period of time and then they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. And unto Adam alone did he give and wherewithal to cover his shame of all the beasts and cattle. On this account, it is prescribed on the heavenly tablets as touching, in other words, regarding all those who, who know the judgment of the law, that they should cover their shame and should not uncover themselves as the Gentiles uncover themselves. And on the new moon of the fourth month, Adam and his wife went forth from the Garden of Eden and they dwelt in the land of Elda, in the land of their creation. And Adam called the name of his wife Eve. And they had no son till the first jubilee. And after this, he knew her. Now he tilled the land as he had been instructed in the Garden of Eden. Now he tilled the land as he had been instructed in the Garden of Eden. So he was driven out of the Garden of Eden to the land of Elda, and he tilled the land of Elda just as he tilled the Garden of Eden. Okay, so he treated the land of Elda basically the same way as he treated the, the, the Garden of Eden. Lots of very interesting information here. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. So that concludes our reading. Don't miss tomorrow's video, day five. It is going to be exciting. Thanks again for watching.